period music is generally come to mean now music from the 16th century on being played on the instruments for which it was written rather than the instruments necessarily of the modern symphony orchestra all of which have been altered changed and modernized to suit the needs of today people who played this music were very much like we are they had certain tools that they used and certain sounds they were trying to create and that if we use the same materials that they use if we you know make the reeds the way they did and we approach the music the way they did that we'll understand the music more we'll hear something that they heard we'll hear it the way they meant it to be and that's there's something really wonderful about that i mean there's something timeless about that as we try to understand something from another age in our own in our own way with our own ears particularly from the 17th 18th century on uh, about the time that america was being colonized and then became a country the music became very splendid indeed and was played on glorious instruments like the one at which i'm sitting now this golden harpsichord and this music by european composers handel bach vivaldi a little later mozart haydn and beethoven was written for instruments that are slightly different from the ones we have today mostly all made of wood some instruments now are metal a lot softer a lot sweeter and designed for smaller spaces. Mozart's piano was about half the size of the piano that you hear it on now. Therefore the whole dynamic of the piece is different. So you're listening to it totally differently. We can't say, we're not arrogant to say it now to say this is how Mozart did it. But we can tell the proportions of how it must have sounded. Because Mozart never played the same piece twice. He improvised all over it. So if you did it one day and you played it the next day, it would be different. So nothing's fixed in stone that way. But you can say Mozart's piano sounded like this, approximately like this, and it was this soft, and therefore everybody around it had to play that softly in order for it to be heard. to people uh, when they were doing some research, mostly in the 60s, uh, the 1960s, that uh, instruments in the Baroque era were different from the way they are made now. Violins were a little different and the wind instruments were a lot different. If you compare an orchestra, let's say we had an orchestra with a singer and the singer was the soloist and they were singing something. That'd be sort of like if you hear some rock music and you hear the singer singing something and then there's a guitar lick. That's a whole, that's kind of a lot the way a Baroque uh, orchestra or violins in a Baroque orchestra would support a singer. In Handel arias, for example, the singer sings their thing and then the violins imitate or comment on it in some way, a lot like a, a guitar would do a riff in between lines of a, of, a, of a pop song. When you play in the section of an orchestra, uh, one thing that you notice right away with the instruments of the time of Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven is that the, 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 each instrument actually has a unique voice, a unique sound, I think to a larger extent than modern instruments, which tend to sound a little bit more of the same. And this couldn't possibly happen with period instruments. They, they each have a um, um, really unique and independent voice. And the flute sounds just more woody, a slight little bit more air than the modern instrument, for example. But given that it's the clarinet, um, I think the clarinet just has a slightly warmer sound than the modern one, and certainly a sound that's quite different from the other instruments. When you see the one that sticks up and has the bell sticking up, that's the bassoon. The one that's like a periscope going up out of the wind, the woodwind section. I like that it lets me play lower than I can sing. I can't sing very low, um, but I can play very low on the bassoon, and I get to kind of be the, the fundament of the ensemble, the, the base of the ensemble, everything that the, that the ensemble sits on. That's, that's my role, I'm the foundation. So I always think that the bassoon sound is a very human sound. And when we're working with singers, and you might have a singer who's saying, oh, no, you know, then the bassoon will do something like And it's like, it's like, this, it's the same thing. It's the instrument saying, oh, no, you know. 
Fifth grade in middle school, I played this modern flute, and I always wondered, why did they say it was part of the woodwind family of instruments? I mean, I could see that the oboe was made out of wood, and the clarinet was made out of wood, the bassoon was made out of wood, and then here I had this metal flute. And I wondered, you know, what was up with that? And it wasn't until, obviously, later when I found out, gee, the early flutes were made out of wood, and I got to play them, that I was totally in love with the way they sounded and the way it felt to play them, and it made so much sense. This is where they came from. And the early wood flutes blend so well with their other counterparts that are also made out of wood. I think it, it's so cool to play these wooden instruments. The sound is really warm, and they can do things that the modern flute can't do. You can do really cool, crazy sounding trills. And some of them sound sort of bird-like. This is my cello. It's a five-string cello, um, which is rather unusual from the 17th century. On a Baroque cello, there is no end pin. And, and the end pin was an adaption on the modern cello to help you hold it up. <laughs> so it's a prop on the floor. Another difference is, of course, the type of string we use, which is um, made of sheep's intestines, sheep's gut, as opposed to steel. Then in this cello, um, as opposed to a modern instrument, a modern cello, there are only four strings. This one has five. It has the normal four strings as a cello, a modern cello, which is the C, the G, the D, the A. In addition, there's a high E string. So this is a very rare instrument um, to, to see from the period. The Baroque instruments have maybe a quieter sound, but they have a larger dynamic range. On a modern instrument, your, your bass dynamic is pretty high already. They cannot play as softly as we can play. Within one note, we can play from a very soft point to a very loud point and come back very quickly. So. That sort of ability to swell on a note is, is unique to these Baroque instruments. This horn is in E-flat. It's probably about 18 feet long, if you stretch it all the way out. Um, the selection of notes that it plays, just by itself, is very limited. So you can see that there's a lot of notes missing that there would be on a violin or a piano or in the voice. The method that was developed to play the notes in between is to insert the hand in the bell. This is really where the hand horn gets its name. And what we do is we actually close our hand by degrees inside the bell, open and close. And by using this method, we can actually get more notes between the open notes. So for every open note, we can close each one. So now we've effectively doubled the number of notes that we can play on this very simple instrument. The role of the drums is most often uh, associated with the trumpets. We're the loud guys, you know, the trumpets and the drums. This is a jingling Johnny. That's the English uh, word for this instrument. It's originally from Turkey. All you do is shake it. A 
we're accentuating or punctuating what's what's really important in the, in the, in the measure. Sometimes I play very little, but I feel that we're indispensable uh, because uh, there come those big moments in a piece where you really need the the, uh, the heavy stuff. So this is the Baroque oboe. It's a uh, very simple type of instrument. Uh, so you can see it has very few keys, just the holes. I have a couple of keys here. This one to reach the hole that I can't quite reach with my finger. And this one actually opens a hole so that I don't have to keep my finger there the entire time, which one could do. But, uh, and it's, as I said, it's a very simple instrument. It's sort of like a, like a chair leg with holes. And, um, but the simplicity of the design has uh, nothing to do with uh, how complex the things you can do with it uh, are. It's sort of like a paintbrush or a pencil in that regard. Um, we could spend a lot of time talking about the features of the oboe, but this makes no noise at all. Uh, in order to make the noise, I need to put in a reed. This is the, the actual interesting bit of it. To get it to play, I have to make something that makes a sound like that, and it sounds horrible by itself. It's really am amazing that you can actually make music with it. But we put it in the oboe, we can actually do something. Every instrument we're talking about here was developed before microphones and electronic technology changed the whole picture. Because now you could take a period instrument orchestra and put it in a 3,000 seater hall, or you could put it in Candlestick Park and put microphones on it. If we wanted to use them, we don't, in fact, but we don't use that, except, of course, to make CDs and to get on people's iPods. That's all the other side, the technical side of the business. And we're just as state of the art as any other music organization. We use every bit of technology that's available to us. Uh, but we don't stick microphones in these instruments so that they can be heard by an audience. We just have a smaller audience.